thanks so much for an awesome conference. I think this may be my favorite EAG ever, actually. Um, oh, yeah, well, we have certain people to thank for that. So let's put a big round of applause for Katie, Amy, Julia, Barry, and Kerry. Did an awesome job. Now being to the TED conference, they have an army of 500 people running it, so we have five. Um, shows just um, how dedicated they are. But we also had like, an amazing team of volunteers um, led by Tessa, so a round of applause for like, their help as well. But yeah, seriously, you all crushed it, so thank you. Um, cool, well, it's just a little few kind of conference highlights. Um, you know, there's tons of good stuff at the conference, can't talk about it all, but you know, there are many kind of amazing talks. Um, we can't, you know, I, sadly, every EAG, I end up going to about zero, but I heard they were really good. <laughs> um, uh, so we had a good time there. We had awesome um, VR. I talked about from animal equality. Uh, I talked about the importance of the idea of like really trying to get in touch with kind of particular intuition. So I hope many of you had a chance to um, experience that. Um, we all had loads of fun along the way. This photo makes us look like we had a kind of rave room going on. <laughs> um, I want to draw particular attention to Igor's blank stare, <laughs> but like a little smile. So you know, I want to know what he was having. Um, uh, and then most importantly, we're going to have great conversations. So look at this photo. Look how nice Max and Becky look. <laughs> Just like, you know, you want them to be your kids or something. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of heartwarming. Um, my own personal highlight um, uh, was, uh, you know, again, talking, getting to talk with Holden, but in particular, him telling us about his love of stuffed animals. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, you might not know that from his open philanthropy posts, but he's going to write about it in the future. <laughs> um, I talked about like having a different kind of gestalt, different worldview. Um, the one that actually like um, the aspect of that, of like having kind of new perspective in the world, that feeling of like gestalt shift, was uh, actually most like in some stuff Holden said, where in particular kind of emphasizing the importance of uh, self-care, of this idea of just. You know, he worked out what's the average number of hours he works in a week. That's his fixed pot. <laughs> like, you can't work harder than that, really. And, uh, you know, there's no reason to kind of feel bad about that. And, uh, yeah, in my own case, I was like, well, obviously, I kind of know that cogn like on an abstract level or something. But having hearing it from someone who I kind of admire as much and I know is as productive as Holden is, like, really helped turn that into, like, something that I kind of feel uh, now I think kind of I'm able to feel kind of uh, on more of a gut level. So the uh, theme of the conference was stay curious, and you know I talked uh, earlier on about the you know contrast between Athens and Sparta. I think we definitely got a good demonstration that you are all excellent Athenians, excellent philosophers. Uh, in particular, I told the story about. You know, philosophers at this old conference not being able to make it to the, a bar after the conference. Well, last night, attempting to go to the speaker's reception, kind of two groups of us. One goes into an elevator before, before us. Me and my group kind of go in, go down, and the others just aren't there. Scott Garibrand tells me they went from the fourth floor down to the first, doors open, doors close again, and they go back, right back up to the fourth. <laughs> so, um, didn't want to say I told you so, but like, um, yeah, you're ve de we're definitely doing well on the philosopher side of things. Um, the thing I want to emphasize now, so we talked about, you know, uh, being curious over the course of this conference. Now I'm going to talk a bit just about, you know, taking that attitude and continuing it over to the, the following year. And I'm just going to kind of give quickly the, you know, kind of three arguments or ways of thinking just to emphasize kind of how little we know and uh, how important it therefore is to you know, keep kind of such an open mind. So the first argument is just how recent many kind of 
uh, intellectual innovations were. So like the idea of probability theory, that's only a few centuries old. <laughs> so for like most of kind of human civilization, we just didn't really have the concept of thinking probabilistically. So you know, if we'd made the argument like, oh, we're really concerned about risk of human extinctions, not that we think it's definitely gonna happen, but there's some chance it'd be really bad. You know, people would have said just, uh, I don't get it. Like, <laughs> um, and you know, something, I can't even really imagine what it'd be like to just not have really the concept of probability, but yet thousands of years people were operating without that. Um, similarly, utilitarianism. Again, I mean, this kind of goes back a little bit to the Mohists um, in kind of early China, but at least in its modern form, again, only developed in the 18th century. Um, and while effective altruism is definitely not utilitarianism, it's um, uh, you know, clearly part of a similar intellectual current. Um, and the fact that you know, this model view that I think is, you know, has one of the best shots of being like the correct kind of model view was only developed a few centuries ago, well, who kind of knows what the coming centuries have? Uh, more recently as well, like the idea of evidence-based medicine like the term evidence-based medicine only arose in the 90s. Um, it was actually, uh, you know, only really started to be practiced in like the late 1960s. Um, there was almost no kind of attempt to apply the experimental method um, more than kind of 80 years ago. And again, this is just kind of like such an obvious part of our kind of worldview. It's like amazing that this didn't exist before that point. Um, whole field of population ethics, again, kind of what we think of as among the kind of most fundamental kind of crucial considerations, um, only really came to be discussed with Parfit's Reasons and Persons, published in 1984. Um, the use of randomized controlled trials in development economics, at least outside the area of health um, care, uh, again, only in the 1990s, still like very recent by like societal terms. And then the whole idea of kind of AI safety or like the importance of ensuring that um, artificial intelligence, you know, might actually have very bad consequences. Uh, again, really the early 2000s. So this kind of trend should really make us appreciate, like there's so many of these developments that are really kind of should cause radical worldviews, worldview changes. I think it's, you know, should definitely usher in the question of, well, what are the, um, what the further developments over the coming decades that might really switch our views again. Second argument is just then more narrowly up, really big updates that people um, and the EA community in general has kind of made in the past. So again, with my conversation with Holden, he talked about you know, how ve for very many years he did not take seriously the loopy ideas of effective altruism. Um, but as he's kind of written about publicly, has really massively changed his view on um, things like considerations of the long-term future, the moral status of um, non-human animals as well. Um, and again, these are just like, you know, huge kind of worldview changing things. Similarly, in my own case as well, certainly when I started out with effective altruism, I really thought of, you know, there's this body of people form the kind of scientific establishment and they kind of work on stuff and then they produce answers and that's knowledge and then you can just act on that. Um, and that's the kind of way the scientific establishment works. Turns out things are a little bit more complicated than that, um, a little bit more human. Um, and that just unfortunately the state of empirical science is like a lot less robust than I'd thought. Um, and you know, that came out in the kind of early days of relying on say the disease control priorities project which had um, you know, much shakier methodology and in fact mistakes that um, I really, really wouldn't have predicted kind of at the time. And that's definitely been a big shift in my own way of kind of understanding the world. Um, and then in two different ways kind of, you know, for my colleagues at FHI, they're kind of views on nanotechnology where um, it really used to be the case that nanotechnology was, or atomically precise manufacturing, was regarded as kind of one of the kind of existential risks. And I think people just converge on thinking that actually that argument was kind of very much overblown. On the other side, kind of Eric Drexler spent, you know, most of his life saying, like, actually, atomically precise manufacturing is the kind of panacea. We can be in a post-scarcity world. We can have radical abundance. This is going to be amazing. And then was able to kind of change his mind and actually think, well, actually, I'm not sure if it might be good, might be bad, I'm not sure. Um, despite having kind of worked and promoted these ideas for decades, this is, like, actually kind of amazing that... Um, 
people in the community are able to have kind of shifts like that. Then the third kind of argument I'll give you. So if we've made these updates, perhaps we'll make such significant updates again in the future. And then the third class of um, arguments is just all the category of things that we still really don't understand. So I mean, my, um, you know, the thing I'm focused on most at the moment is trying to build this field of global priorities research to try and address some of these questions, get more smart people working on them. But one is just how we should you know, weigh probabilities against very large amounts of value. So um, you know, we clearly think that most of the time, something like expected utility theory gets the right answers. Um, but then it starts to get kind of, people get to start a bit antsy about it when it comes to very, very low probabilities of um, sufficiently like large amounts of value. Uh, when we then start thinking about, well, what about infinite amounts of value, if we're happy to think about very, very large amounts of value as long-termists often are thinking about, you know, if we think it's not wacky to talk about that, why not about infinite amounts? But then you've, you know, you're really starting to throw a spanner in the works of any sort of kind of reasonable decision theory. And it just is the case. We just have like no idea at the moment really how to handle this problem. Um, similarly, with something you know, Open Phil has worked a lot on what entities count. Um, you know, we're very positive about expanding the kind of model circle, but how far should that go? Um, you know, non-human animals, of course. What about insects? What about plants or something like? Seems like we have a strong intuition that you know plants don't have consciousness, perhaps don't count. We don't really have any good kind of underlying understanding of why that is the case. Um, the, you know, there's uh, plenty of people kind of trying to work on this in the cutting edge, Qualia Research Institute, who are here among others. Um, but it's like exceptionally difficult. And if we don't know that, then there's like a ton we don't know about doing good. Um, final category is on indirect effects and cluelessness. So. We kind of know that like, most of the impact of our actions are in unpredictable effects <laughs> over the very, very long term because of kind of butterfly effects and so on, because of the ways that our actions will change kind of who is born um, in the future. So we know that that's actually where like, most of the action is, and it's just that we can't predict it at all. <laughs> so we know we're just kind of peering very dimly into the kind of fog of the future. And there's been kind of basically almost no work on like really trying to model that, really trying to think, well, you take this sort of action um, in this country, how does that differ from this other sort of action in this other country in, in terms of its very long run effects? So it's not just that we've got this kind of general abstract argument, you know, looking inductively from experience in terms of how we've, as a society and as a community, changed our mind in the past. Um, it's also that we just know that there's tons of things that we don't understand. So I think like, what's appropriate is a kind of attitude of just you know, deep kind of radical uncertainty when we're you know, trying our best to do good. But what kind of concrete implications does this have? Well, I think there's kind of three main things. So one is just actually trying to kind of get more information. Um, so continuing to do the research, continuing to engage in kind of intellectual inquiry. A second is to keep our options open as much as possible ensuring that we're not closing doors that, even though they look kind of, kind of not too promising, might actually turn out to be much more promising than they were kind of when we gain more information going into the future, when we ch change our minds. Thirdly is you know, plausibly maybe pursuing things that are um, convergently good. So things that look like, yeah, this is a really robustly good thing to do from a wide variety of, um, a wide variety of perspectives or worldviews. So reducing the chance of a great power war, for example. You know, even if my beliefs, my empirical beliefs about the future change a lot, even if my moral beliefs change a lot, I'd still feel very confident that reducing the chance of major war in our lifetime would be a, like, a very good thing to do. So the thing I want to emphasize to you most is, you know, keeping this attitude of kind of uncertainty and exploration um, through kind of what you're doing over the, um, over the coming year. And in response to this kind of, you know, I've emphasized Athens, in response to this F Athens versus Sparta dilemma, trying to, like, you know, bear in mind that we want to stay uncertain, we want to uh, keep conformity at the meta level and cooperate and sympathize with people who, um, you know, have very different 
object level beliefs to us. And so above all, we want to keep exploring and stay curious. Thank you.